In this video, we take a look at preliminary analytics as a tool for risk assessment. When I review audit files, quite often I see this part of risk assessment done inappropriately. Sometimes it's not done at all. Sometimes it's done, but it's not documented correctly. And then sometimes it's done and it's obvious there are risk and material misstatements, but those are not identified and brought forward so that the auditor can properly respond. So let's take a look at preliminary analytics. As we look at preliminary analytics, I want you to think of this as another tool in your tool chest. So there are various things you can do to perform risk assessment. In the last video, we talked about fraud interviews and how you would look for fraud by performing those interviews. This is another tool, this being preliminary analytics, another tool that's in your tool chest. So fraud interviews, preliminary analytics, retrospective reviews of estimates, there are different things that you can do to look for the risk of material misstatement. So here we are in Chapter 10, Preliminary Analytics. We've opened up the toolbox, and we're going to use this tool to see if we can identify any risk of material misstatements. Now, as I look at audit files, sometimes I see that this part of the audit file is not documented correctly. So I want to answer the question, how do you document your preliminary analytics? And the way you're going to do this is you're going to compare numbers. Sometimes the trial balance numbers for this year with the trial balance numbers from the prior year Sometimes you're going to do that at a financial statement level. And I find that the higher the level, the better it is most of the time. Not always, but generally, if you can use financial statement level numbers, uh, that would be good. Now, why do I recommend financial statement level numbers? Well, those are the numbers that the user of the financial statements are going to see. So it's logical to me that if the, the readers of the financial statement are going to be looking at that level, that we as auditors should also look at that level. Now, there are places where you want to take a deeper dive, such as in revenues, you're actually required to look at the, the revenue comparisons at a more granular level. Uh, remember, when you put your preliminary analytics together, generally you want to aggregate at a financial statement level. If not all the way up to the financial statement level, at, at least as much as you can. Some of you have groupers in your trial balances, and say for cash, you might have two or three different groups of cash. Well, if you combine all those together, then you've got the financial statement level cash line, and you're doing comparisons at that level. If you don't do it at that level, then you might break it down to those two or three grouper categories that you have for cash in your trial balance software. So as you document your preliminary analytics, you're going to compare your this year's numbers with the prior year numbers. That can be just the numbers themselves. It can also be ratios. So you might do an inventory turnover ratio, for example, or a debt-to-equity ratio, and you're comparing those ratios with the prior years. Now, one of the questions that comes up about preliminary analytics is how many years comparison should you perform? And I would do, obviously, at a minimum, a one-year, well, a two-year comparison this year with the prior year. 
But generally, I like to see three to four years, if possible, five years. The longer, uh, the more comparative numbers you have, the better off you are. It gives you a better perspective about how the numbers behave. So at a minimum, compare this year's numbers with the prior year numbers. If possible, look at three, four, five years of comparisons as you do your preliminary analytics. Now, as you do this, you need to create some expectations. So you, you see four points here about documentation of preliminary analytics. One of those is to document your expectations. That's the first thing. The second thing is to actually create the comparative numbers or ratios then three, see if there's any unexpected activity. And finally, conclude, uh, have you detected any risk of material misstatements or not? Now, without expectations, we're simply bringing numbers together and comparing those, but then if they don't behave correctly and we haven't really thought about what the expectation is, we may not identify a risk of material misstatement that we should have. So the first thing we need to do is document the expectations. When you do this, you don't need to develop an expectation for every comparative number. Uh, generally, what I'm doing is talking about the key expectations. So if I think revenue should go up 2 to 3%, then I'm saying on the preliminary analytical work paper that I believe revenues will go up 2 to 3%. If I know that they've just incurred $10 million of debt, and let's say they didn't have any in the prior year, well, my expectation would be that debt would go up $10 million. Another example here is, let's suppose that last year accounts payable was $100,000. You've talked to the client, they've been short on cash, and the client tells you, We've had an accumulation of invoices to pay at the end of the year, and it's going up by about $200,000. Those types of expectations would be documented on the work paper. Now, let me say again, you don't need an expectation for every comparison that's showing up in the preliminary analytics, just the main parts. So that's number one, document expectations. Number two, create your comparisons. So most auditors do this by pulling down the trial balance. In most audit software today, it will generate for you these comparisons. Some people use thresholds such as I want to see everything over 10%. In other words, see every account that changed by more than 10%. Some auditors also say, I want to see everything that changed by 10% and more than, say, $50,000. I'm not a big fan of using thresholds, either percentages or dollars. Why? Well, let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you expected a certain number to go up $300,000, and it didn't go up at all. So when you compare this year's numbers with the prior year number, no change occurred. And because you scoped that account out by saying, for example, only show me the accounts that changed by more than $100,000, well, now that account doesn't even show up. So I'd be careful about using thresholds when you perform preliminary analytics. Not, I'm not saying don't use those at all. I'm just saying I would be careful in using those. Step number three, see if there's any unexpected activity. So you can 
you compare your numbers, you look at the documented expectations that you did in step one, and now is there any unexpected activity? It could be, to use that example again, that you expected an account to go up, say, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, and it didn't go up at all. Well, if you look at those comparisons, no change, but no change doesn't mean no risk. The risk comes in unexpected activity. So a lot of auditors, when they do the comparative analytics, sometimes there's no change and they think, okay, well, no risk. Well, not necessarily. If we expect change and it doesn't occur, well, that's a risk also. Additionally, if there's a, a large change and we didn't expect it, in other words, we thought the account would stay about the same, but it goes up greatly, that would be another potential risk of material misstatement. When you finish documenting expectations, your comparisons, and then your unexpected activity, once you look at that, then you're going to document in a conclusion statement whether or not you've identified any uh, risk of material misstatement. Normally on my preliminary analytics work paper at the bottom, I've got a conclusion statement, and it might say, for example, all of the account activities behaved in a manner that I expected with the exception of revenues. I expected revenues to go up 2 to 3%. They actually went up 8%. Then I would bring that risk of material misstatement to my summary risk assessment form. We'll talk about that in a moment. But those are the four steps in documentation. And, you know, when I teach this, sometimes people say to me, but where do the expectations come from? Well, good question. They come from past changes in numbers. So many of you are doing audits that you've done for many years. You pretty much know how the numbers are going to behave. And because you do, then you've created expectations based on your past work with this client. Another place that expectations come from is your discussions with management. Uh, so you may want to talk to management, or let me suggest that you do talk with management before you do your preliminary analytics, and they should be telling you what they expect the changes to be. Another really good place to find expectations is in the minutes. I would always read the minutes before I do my preliminary analytics, and that will help. Another area is your knowledge of events that are going on. So if you already know that, say, the staffing was cut by 20%, then you would expect payroll to come down. And then finally, non-financial statistics. So what you can do is talk to the salespeople. If they give you the sales statistics and say the company has been selling 10,000 widgets a year for the last three years, but they sold 20,000 this year, then you've got an expectation to see revenues increase. So here's an expectation example that you would put on the preliminary analytics work paper. Sales have declined approximately 5% in each of the last two years. I expect sales to decline 3 to 5% in the current year. So just wanted you to see an example of how to document expectations. And then here's an example of a conclusion statement. Uh, I expected payroll to be stable since the company's workforce remained at 425 people. However, payroll expenses increased by 22%. And you're like, what's, what's up with that? 
once I get done with the preliminary analytics work and I've made that conclusion statement, then I'm bringing everything over to the risk assessment form. Again, we see this step in every one of these videos. So you pull out your toolbox, you do your preliminary analytics. If you identify a risk of material misstatement, then you're bringing it down to the risk assessment summary form. So that's how you do your preliminary analytics. That's how you document it. In conclusion, what you're doing is you're creating expectations. Then you're documenting your comparisons of this year's numbers with the prior year or prior years. Once you do this, you look for changes that were unexpected. And if there were changes that were unexpected, then that might be an indicator of a risk of material misstatement. And then I'm going to bring that into my risk assessment summary form. Next week, we're taking a look at the closed process or in the next video. And I hope you'll join me then as we look at another part of the risk assessment process. Till then, take care and have a sunny day. Bye now.